and welcome to the program. Well, that little sound bite, I hope that's just a little bit of tease about some of the things we're going to talk about for the hour. And frankly, uh, Olive Tree's carrying a brand new book by author Jeff Kinley, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, Ten Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. And so let me read a paragraph uh, from the book, and the author says, These days, more and more people find themselves drawn toward the apocalyptic, including those who frequent conferences, read books, magazines, and blogs, and watch movies with this theme. Even novels on the subject have become national bestsellers. But the common thread knitting all these people together is that, like you, they long to know what God's Word says about future things. They want to know what's coming and, if possible, discover a general idea of when. And the author says, more importantly, many seek the practical difference those prophecies can make in their lives right now. Now, I've got the author of the book, Jeff Kinley, online with me. We're going to talk about this for the hour. Jeff, welcome back to the program. Great, Jan. Good to be with you again. Yeah, Jeff, read the book through uh, cover to cover, and of course, um, Olive Tree's carrying it, and you list you list four points that stand in the way of understanding the theology of the last days, known as eschatology. I'm just going to quickly cite them as bullet points, but I do want your feedback. You say, prophecy can be difficult to understand. You say, the average Christian does not hear this teaching from their pastor. Point number three, the topic can scare people. You say, some see no practical relevance to the topic. Do you have a, a solution to these problems? Well, I do, and the biggest solution is, is that we as the body of Christ need to be talking about Bible prophecy, and that really begins, or should begin, from the pulpit. I actually list in the back of the book several reasons why pastors today are not preaching on Bible prophecy. And I think one of the biggest, Jan, is that a lot of pastors are just trying to get by in their ministries, or trying to fill up their uh, their sanctuaries, their auditoriums, or whatever. And sometimes there's a perception that Bible prophecy will drive people away, yes. when in reality, it'll actually draw them in. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm seeing is it needs to begin in the pulpit, and from the pulpit, people take their leadership cues from their spiritual leaders, and so shepherds need to pastor their people by teaching them about what some 28 percent of the Bible, That's right. and especially since we're actually living in these times where these prophecies are in the process of being fulfilled. I'd like to add a couple of bullet points, if you don't mind, because one would be, and you've already alluded to it, it doesn't fit into the sort of the church growth efforts that are prominent in the church today. So, and I think another is uh, it's been dropped by so many seminaries. And then the false teachers have given it a bad name. The Herald Campaigns, the Edgar Wisenhunts, the Date Setters, other sensationalists, things like Y2K. We had a, in 2017, we had had a so-called celestial alignment on September 23rd. Not much came from it, but there was a huge amount of hype around it. The blood moons, huge hype. The Mayan apocalypse, 2012. I mean, no wonder what was a passion in the 1970s and the 1980s has kind of gone south in the 90s and going forth from there because so much is coming against this topic, as you say, the pulpits, and then we can throw in a couple dozen other things. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think you're right on point, is, is that a lot of people who have come out to speak about certain end times events uh, have really counterfeited what the Bible is saying. They'll take a kernel of truth from the Scripture and they'll make it into a whole field of, of harvest, you know, of end times prophecies, and talk about things that the Bible really never says. And I think that's one of the reasons why, Jan, a lot of Christians are saying, you know, I don't know that I really want to be able to focus on that, because that's kind of scary, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a Rubik's Cube, and I'm not that smart to figure it out. And So I've had many Christians tell me, Jan, I'm afraid to open the door to the book of Revelation. Okay. Uh, just simply because of some of the sensationalism that uh, they've read or, or seen. And of course, it's far more than the book of Revelation. We've got some classic uh, Old Testament chapters, uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, Zechariah, and Matthew's got a great account of end times, and I'm going to get to some of that as we move along here in the hour. But you have, I'm turning here to page 20 on the book. So what does knowing about prophecy do for you? And you've got about, my goodness, probably about 15, 16, 
16 bullet points here. Let me just highlight a few that you talk about. Prophecy helps you understand the times in which you live. Two, prophecy calms your fears about the future. You say prophecy gives you confidence, courage, and comfort in the present. You say prophecy increases your faith in God, who's in control of Earth's story. And you give scripture for everything here. You say prophecy gives you positive hope in a hopeless world, rescuing you from despair. You say prophecy motivates you to be urgent about your mission here on earth, not wasting your time on worthless pursuits. You say prophecy purifies your life as you prepare yourself as Christ's bride. Point number 15, you say prophecy helps you know what to expect as you live for God in an increasingly hostile world. I could read some more points you have there, Jeff, but what you present here on page 20 of your book honestly ought to inspire every pastor to begin a Sunday night series on this, but they won't. Well, absolutely. I mean, every pastor should want their congregation to grow in their faith, to grow in their confidence uh, in terms of God, and to grow in their passion for God's Word. I mean, there's so many things that that prophecy does for us, Jan, and I think one of the things that it does for me personally, one of the first things it does for me, is it gives me great sense of assurance in the Word of God. I mean, you think back when when the Old Testament prophets, when Isaiah prophesied, and when Jeremiah prophesied, these were these were doing difficult times mm-hmm. the people of God were facing, and yet they looked forward to a day of hope to know that God is in control and that He's in, He's sovereign. He's going to take care of them, and even though they have to may have to go through some difficult times, in the end, God is going to win. And so, prophecy really is, though it includes some obviously you know messages of doom and, and messages of wrath. It is a positive message for those who believe in Jesus. And so I I can't imagine anything more exciting than to talk about how we win in the end. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here, and my ministry's carrying a new book. And we have cut back on some products in the last couple of years, but I was drawn to Jeff Kinley's new book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, Ten Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. And it's in my bookstore, olivetreeviews.org, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org. You can give us a call anytime and order it if you'd like. I know you can find it at your local Christian bookstore as well. And just a couple of more of those bullet points, Jeff, that you write about. Prophecy motivates you to be urgent about your mission here on earth, not wasting your time on worthless pursuits. Prophecy fuels the fire of your desire to see others know Jesus. It it imparts a perspective on the temporary nature of suffering. And oh, that is so important because I tell you, the earth's going through some early stages birth pangs that are heartbreaking. And I appreciate what you say, that it imparts a perspective on the temporary nature of suffering, and it helps you prioritize spiritual things over physical things, living wisely. There's so much more, but I appreciated all those things that you had to share regarding that. Jeff, what I'd kind of like to do is I think I'd like to spend a little time on a section of your book, and it's titled What Lies Ahead. And I'd like to talk, if you don't mind, about the various things to come. That was actually a book title by Dwight Pentecost years and years ago. If that's okay, I'd like to kind of outline the things to come that folks, Christians, need to be aware of. And and I'm going to start with what I think would be the next event on the church calendar, which would be the rapture of the church. That would be the next event on the eschatological clock would be our blessed hope. And you and I take a pre-tribulation position on that. Why don't you tell me why you do? Well, I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture because I believe, obviously, that's what the Bible teaches. I mean, uh, the Bible says that we are not destined for wrath, uh, Paul told the Thessalonians. And, you know, there was great confusion even in the first century about the day of the Lord and, and the coming wrath on planet Earth, and so a lot of Christians were confused, as they are today. But I think it's important for us to understand that the Scripture throughout the whole Bible, God teaches that He delivers His people from His wrath. It's not just tribulation that we get delivered from, but from the tribulation that is coming. And we see that, I think, Jen, in the promise of Jesus in John 14, verses 1 through 3, where Christ promises uh, in in that beautiful betrothal bride Mm -hmm. uh, imagery there to return and to receive us to himself. I think we see it, obviously, in the prophecies of Paul. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 4. We see it in 2 Thessalonians 2, where he talks about the end times. We see it in the pattern of deliverance of the godly. We see uh, God delivering Noah from the flood, delivering Lot from right. Sodom and Gomorrah before his wrath came. I think we see it also really in the portrayal of the church in the book of Revelation. You know, I find it very interesting that uh, the word, the actual word church, ecclesia, 
is mentioned some 19 times in chapters 1 through 3. The portrayal of the church, we see it again coming back with Christ in chapter 19 and then again in chapter 22. But in the chapters that deal with God unleashing his wrath on planet Earth, Jan, there's not one single solitary mention of the church on Earth. That's right. And I find that to be very significant, and we know that he has promised to deliver us from the hour of testing that is to come, Revelation 3 tells us. And so there are many other reasons, obviously, we could list why the, the pre-trib rapture, I think, is the valid viewpoint. Now, there are lots of people who don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, some of them very vehemently so, objecting to it. There are obviously other views of the deliverance of the saints. Uh, there's obviously the mid-trib view, which, you know, basically says that Christ comes back for us at the midpoint of the tribulation. And, you know, there's some other views there, post-trib, and which uh, kind of has the rapture and the second coming happening mm-hmm. at, at the same time. I even had someone come up to me at a conference here recently, I was speaking at a prophecy conference, and say that they strongly believed in a partial rapture, yeah. Jan, which, which basically says that some Christians will go, but other Christians will yeah. have to stay behind because they've been disobedient. Yeah. But of course, I don't find it's any... It's not in the Bible. Effect. Yeah, in yeah. the Scripture. Well, the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation, uh, not the church. And I think the key verse is Revelation 3.10, and that's uh, speaking to the true church, telling them they will be spared from the wrath to come. Um, I would like to play just a short clip of uh, Pastor Billy Crone, and he's actually, this is from his DVD set on the seals of Revelation, and he's asking, I happen to be in the little clip, that's not why I'm playing it though, it's uh, myself, Dr. Dave Reagan, and Pastor J.D. Farag, and he's asking, what do you think life will be like immediately after the rapture? What do you think the state of the world is going to be in right after the rapture? Well, with the restrainer gone, I think it's going to be... We think we have anarchy now and chaos now. We haven't seen anything yet. It's going to be uh, lawlessness, anarchy, chaos. I think some people who are going to have heard the gospel and even have heard about the rapture are going to say to themselves, And I wish I had listened. Something, this reminds me of something I was told that could happen. But I think um, things are going to start to fall. I think the stock market will crash. I think there'll be just general chaos. And I think it will be setting the stage for a man with a plan, a Mr. Fix-It. Well, words like astonishment, fear, despair, terror, anguish, I think are going to be representative of how people are feeling. I think it's going to be the greatest calamity since Noah's flood. Uh, I think there'll be martial law everywhere. Uh, I think people will be asking for an explanation. Right after the rapture, it's going to be a time, I believe, of a pseudo-peace. Likely very short-lived, but there will be this false peace under the banner of this quest, this insatiable quest for peace and security. However, it will be, again, very short-lived, and it will be followed by unthinkable and unspeakable destruction and death. Talking to uh, author Jeff Kinley this hour. Jeff uh, has authored over 30 books, speaks across the country. His ministry equips churches to discern the times. He's got a weekly podcast you might want to check out at jeffkinley.com, jeffkinley.com. Jeff, your thoughts on that little clip? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Envisioning a post-rapture world, we really don't have a template or a concept in our mind, because we've never had anything like this in our lifetime. But I agree, there will be mass chaos, calamity, confusion, anarchy, rampant sin. It's going to be just like those levees in New Orleans Mm. and that broke uh, during the hurricane. Nothing's going to stop uh, the sin tsunami that's going to come upon planet yes. Earth. And mainly, as you mentioned, because the restrainer is going to be removed, the Holy Spirit's influence through the Bride of Christ, through the Church, is gone. And so just imagine that there's no voice of morality, there's no one holding back tide of sin, and so it's going to be humanity left to themselves. That is a scary thought. It really is. We're talking Bible prophecy this hour. I just want to give you a quick heads up. 
particularly if you're living on the West Coast, because I will be joining some of my Prophecy Leader ministry friends on Saturday, January 5th in Southern California. I'll be joining uh, Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, and Pastor Barry Stagner at the Awaiting His Return Conference, Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. You must register at cctustin.org, cctustin.org. It will be live streamed. Again, please contact cctustin.org. Don't contact Olive Tree. Contact the church out there. And the event begins at 8.30 a.m. Pacific. It's one day only, Saturday, January 5th, cctustin.org with Amir Sarfati, Jack Hibbs, Barry Stagner, and myself. So I hope you can tune in, or even better yet, you can turn up that day, but you do need to register. It's a very nominal cost. Okay, we're going to take a short break here in a minute, but I want to hit some of the other things to come, because you write, and I thank you for doing it, and you go into detail. Again, the book is Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy. He goes into detail of the things to come. We've got the Bema Seat. We've got the Marriage of the Lamb. We've got the Battle of Gog and Mag. These are things on the horizon, folks. We've got Jesus' second coming. We've got the judgment of Israel, the judgment of the Gentiles. We've got Satan's binding. We've got the saints' resurrection. We've got the millennium. We've got Satan's release and final rebellion. We've got the great white throne judgment. God destroys heaven and earth after the millennium. And then we've got the new heavens and the new earth. That's all our future for a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what lays ahead of us. And I would think you'd want to know the things to come. We'll talk about it when we get back. Coming back in just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. Today's guest in Understanding the Times Radio, Jeff Kinley, will return next week to continue his two-part series. Plan to be with us next week as Jeff continues to unpack the secrets of Bible prophecy. Remember to save another date as well, the date for our next Understanding the Times conference. Our next Twin Cities event is set for September 21st, 2019. We'll be giving more details about this conference early next year. We are so thankful that our audience has grown in 2018. More of you have decided to become partners with us in this ministry through your financial support. To all of you, we just want to say thank you. As our year comes to a close, we encourage you to help us end 2018 in the black with a tax-deductible gift to this listener-supported broadcast ministry. Please write with your gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also give by phone when you dial 763-559-4444. Jan returns with pastor and author Jeff Kinley right after this brief timeout. First Chronicles 12 says that the sons of Issachar were men who understood the times. That is the challenge to every believer today to understand our times and to become watchmen on the wall. Thank you for allowing this ministry and this radio outreach to do that for you every day of the year. As the world grows darker, you're going to be called upon to be a light to the world and to delay the decay. Why not mark your calendar right now for Understanding the Times 2019, where you can better learn how to do this. The date is Saturday, September 21st, just outside of Minneapolis, Grace Church, Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Our speakers will include Amir Sarfati, J.D. Farag, Dr. Robert Jeffress, and Jack Hibbs. I will have a message that day as well. Tickets will go on sale next summer. Visit our conference page at olivetreeviews.org for more details. In the meantime, look up for our Redemption Draws Nigh. We only see the Jesus that walks around in sandals and a robe and puts children on his lap and, you know, gives out food and fish and bread and that type of thing. But we're not seeing the Jesus of Revelation. And that's who's coming back. That's who's riding a white, triumphant steed, victory, as he comes back and to slaughter his enemies. And that's, this is part of the wrath of God on planet Earth is that uh, he returns to, uh, to slaughter his enemies at Armageddon and to begin to set up his kingdom. Jeff Kinley is the author of the new release, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What Scripture Really Says. It's also the theme of today's discussion. Once again, with our guest, author Jeff Kinley, here's Jan Markell. What should Christians do to prepare? Quit looking down and start looking up, because Jesus is coming. 
Let optimism replace pessimism because Jesus is coming. Don't despair for the future, but prepare for it because the rapture comes long before Armageddon. Christ comes before the Antichrist. The Son of God comes before the Son of Perdition. The true prophet comes before the false prophet. The Prince of Peace comes before the Prince of Persia. The I Am comes before the I Want to Be. The Blessed Hope comes before the Lost Hope. And the beginning comes before the end. Don't let anyone rob you of your blessed hope. Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when it is. People ask me, you think it's going to be at the barley harvest or this or that? Listen, I'm just telling you, I think things are going to get really, 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 really ugly before the rapture of the church. Are Christians supposed to expect to suffer tribulation? Absolutely. Preaching and believing the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is not some type of escapist doctrine taught by those who want to avoid the worst time of suffering and destruction that man will ever follow. In fact, I'm a preacher of the Word of God. You know what I'd like to be? I'm just telling you, I'm probably a glutton for punishment, but if if there's any revival compared to today, I'd like to be here. But I won't. It's not my choice. All astute Bible students have always taught that the time of Daniel's 70th week, I said astute Bible students, I don't care how old they are or how dead they've been, the time period, the tribulation period referred to as Jacob's trouble is not the church. It's not the church. It's Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. It's not the church. Okay, welcome back. That was Doug Stoffer. I like that little clip that I found of him talking about things to come. And I'm talking for the hour with author Jeff Kinley because we're carrying his book, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy. Jeff, would you agree with Doug that ugly things could happen before the rapture? Oh, absolutely. In fact, Jesus said that leading up to this time that he talks about, the time of Jacob's trouble, that our world will resemble the days of Noah. That's right. And I believe that as we look back at Genesis chapter 6 and we see what's going on there, I mean, it's just a a time of uh, unprecedented ungodliness, of unrestrained immorality, of a worldwide violence and lawlessness. And we're just seeing fires uh, all over the world just like that with this tide of ungodliness that we see today. So, yes, I do believe that things are going to get worse before they get better. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the previous segment, I said I want to continue looking at the topic of things to come because you outlined them in this book. And, folks, if you're trying to figure out kind of the Oh, the roadmap ahead. Again, this new book talks about it in detail. We cannot go into detail due to limited time. But Jeff Kinley, uh, The Bemis Seat, The Judgment Seat of Christ. I'm going to do a whole program on that in a couple of weeks with uh, Mark Hitchcock, and that'll probably be Christmas weekend. But this activity has to do with rewards and not sin. And you say this prophecy is a game changer because it tells us that what we do for the kingdom and the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ really does matter. And why don't you explain that? In other words, what we do now, we're going to be rewarded for if we're doing kingdom work. Well, that's exactly right. And the Bema was a, a judgment seat that was used in the ancient Olympic Games, and that's where the the participants in races would receive their uh, their olive wreath, their, their, their crown, their stephanos there. And the Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen to us. And it's outlined for us in 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5, where each of us individually as believers will appear before for this judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards done in the body while on the earth. You know, a lot of Christians are are afraid of this kind of judgment seat, Jan, because they think they're going to be, you know, judged because of their sin. But but thankfully, praise God, that all of our sin was taken care of at the cross, and so we are forgiven eternally forever for our sins because of that. So we don't have to worry about that. What we really need to think about is, am I going to have anything to show for my Christian life once I stand before Jesus Christ? I was speaking on this several years ago at a retreat and about how I really wanted to earn rewards for Christ. And someone came up to me afterwards, Janet, they rebuked me. They said, you shouldn't want to earn rewards. That's mm-hmm. kind of selfish. I said, no, no. I said, on the contrary, I said, I'm going to take those golden crowns one day and cast them at the feet of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So the more rewards you earn, the more glory you get to give back to God. But you're exactly right. It, it's determined upon what we do right now. We get one life. We don't know how long that life's going to be, and every day that we spend for Jesus, we have opportunity through our character and through our commitment, through our service to others and to the church, to be able to earn those rewards. And he will review our lives, and what's of worth will come out as gold, silver, and precious mm-hmm. stones, and, and what is worthless will be burned away as wood, hay, and stubble. Okay, well then, in the outline of things to come, or what lies ahead, as you say, you talk about the marriage of the Lamb. Now, this is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's in the millennium. Uh, but the marriage of the Lamb, and the church is portrayed as the bride of Christ. So uh, talk to us about the marriage
marriage of the Lamb. Yeah, the marriage of the Lamb is essentially the, the consummation of our relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Spirit, uh, He wooed us to Christ. He sealed us at the moment of redemption. He, in essence, betrothed us to Christ. And we are the bride of Christ as the church. And once we uh, participate in the rapture and the beam, I believe that that marriage ceremony is going to be consummated. And what that means is that we'll become who we've always dreamed of becoming. We'll become like Jesus Christ. We'll be made like Him. And we'll, our bodies will be glorified in heaven, and we'll be able to, to know Him as we are known. And, and Christ will fulfill in that moment what He has wanted to do with us from eternity past, and that is for us to be with Him. And we trace that all the way from, from eternity past in Ephesians chapter 1 through His choosing of the disciples to His high priestly prayer in John 17, all the way into heaven, really, is the fact that we get to be with Him. And so that's the marriage. The mar- at the marriage, only the bride is invited to the marriage. But at the marriage supper, that's when the guests and everyone else outside the church age and the bride, that's when they're invited in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as you said, that'll be in the millennial kingdom. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Things to come. The seven-year tribulation, and we've already stated pretty firmly our position. The church is absent from that. But it's kicked off by a peace treaty between the Antichrist and Israel. Unspeakable suffering is going on demon-possessed world leader. The Antichrist takes center stage. It's going to be one world currency, one world religion, government, unspeakable disease, wars, sky black and demonic creatures, godlessness, immorality, sorcery. And we're seeing a little bit of a run-up to that now, but obviously, and we already referenced that, but my goodness, nothing like what's going to take place during that seven-year tribulation from which the church is absent. Yeah, it'll be an unprecedented uh, time in human history. And, and I think it's a very important point to make here, Jan, is the fact that a lot of people, as they look at Revelation, and even theologians and people from different denominational preferences, will look at Revelation and will look at Daniel and some of these prophecies, and they'll try to rationalize them or uh, take them as just being purely symbolic. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you read Revelation, all the Bible is relevant. And when you read Revelation, you'll see that in, at no time it, throughout human history, and particularly in the last 2,000 years, have any of these events in any form taken place. And so we have to to come to the conclusion that if they haven't happened in the past, then these horrific coming judgments are yet future and must come at another time. And as you mentioned, praise God, we'll be absent from that. But at the same time, Earth is going to suffer and Earth's inhabitants are going to endure an unimaginable time of God unleashing His wrath through those judgments. Frankly, I hope that in heaven, as we are enjoying heaven those uh, seven years, we don't know (laughs) what's going on down here. You know, a lot of listeners are going to have folks left behind, and that's kind of an ominous thing to think about. So... uh, I hope that we're just enjoying heaven and not aware of what's happening as the earth is judged. I've had that thought as well about uh, friends and family that will be left behind. I think just a word of encouragement Mm -hmm. quickly uh, to your listeners, Jan, is that the kind of lifestyle that we lead right now, the kind of relationships that we have with our unsaved relatives and friends, will have a great testimony to them in a post-rapture scenario. In other words, I believe God will bring to remember some of those things that you may have said to them, books you may have bought, uh, things you may have shown them, uh, and it may actually lead to their salvation. So uh, we can still plant seeds now. That's true. Very good. Okay, things to come, probably. And I don't think we know, Jeff, the timing of the Battle of Gog Magog. My hunch is it's going to be early in the tribulation. It's based in Ezekiel 38-39. Israel is dwelling in sort of peace and safety, I guess maybe trusting in the Antichrist, correct? Yeah, and and that's the thing that really does kind of kick off this seven-year time period is the peace treaty, the Antichrist brokers with Israel. But here's here's something that's very interesting, and you alluded to this earlier, is that during this time in a a post-rapture sort of pre-apocalyptic age here in planet Earth, the whole world's focus now comes right back to Israel. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? When you read a book, you want to say, well, how's the book going to end? Well, you have to keep reading the book, and when you keep reading this book, the Bible, you'll find out that the focus goes all the way back to Israel again. And you're right, I don't think we actually know when this battle's going to take place, but you know, I'm like you, I kind of see it in the early stages, right after this peace treaty has been brokered. I think that will be sort of a threat to the Antichrist peaceful 
rule in right. that area. But there, there are going to be this coalition of nations surrounding Israel that are going to come against Israel. And the Bible says that uh, it's going to be a classic uh, David versus Goliath matchup. And amazingly, God's going to win this battle for Israel against all these nations. And you know what's really interesting is you think about who these nations are, who they correlate to today, Jan. All of them but one are Muslim nations, and several of them have made it their stated goal to annihilate the Jewish people off the planet. And so this is not some far-fetched you know, war that we're dreaming up here. This is something that we're actually seeing uh, the, the pieces of the puzzle being put into place right now. And then these invaders, they're going to turn on each other. you got a quote of Mark Hitchcock in the book here. These nations will swoop down to claim the land, but all they will get to claim is their own burial plots. And that is true. And Israel may have no one to reach out to. The Bible indicates that some nations are standing afar off protesting, but they're not really helping. Right. So God's going to step in, and he's going to turn on these countries, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, and possibly other nations with these nations with intent to seize a spoil, seize the wealth of Israel. We're going to be gone. We're not going to be able to see it. would be interesting to know exactly how it plays out. We may or may not know that, but that's all found in Ezekiel 38, 39. And folks, again, all this outline is carried in the book that we're carrying now, Uncovering the Secrets of Bible Prophecy, 10 Keys for Unlocking What the Scripture Really Says. You can find it in my store, olivetreeviews.org. It'll be in my print and e newsletters, sign up online, give us a call, Central Time, and read it cover to cover, which I can't always do, but I have because uh, the topic was fascinating in my world anyway. Jeff Kinley, uh, he is the author, author of many, many books. You can learn more at jeffkinley.com. I'm moving on to the next major event, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, and that would be, my goodness, Jesus' second coming. We've got Armageddon raging, and I just want to make a comment or two here about to his second coming because he returns with eyes that are a flame of fire and a sharp sword and proceeds out of his mouth. His return catches everyone by surprise because he's coming as a thief in the night. Now, I want to stop here for a minute. A lot of people put that thief in the night passage into for the rapture, but it's for the second coming. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what's very interesting too, Jan, is this is the same Jesus we see in Revelation chapter 1. This is the resurrected, glorified, enthroned Jesus Christ that quite frankly, the church knows very little of. When Jesus gave John this vision of him that we see in Revelation 19, the same Christ, the Bible says that after seeing this Christ, it says he fell at his feet as a dead man. And there is a certain trauma and a certain sobriety that I believe we're missing today mm. in the church because yes. we only see the Jesus that walks around in sandals and a robe and puts children on his lap and, and you know gives out food and fish and bread and that type of thing. But we're not seeing the Jesus of Revelation. And that's who's coming back. That's who's riding a white, triumphant steed victory as he comes back and to slaughter his enemies and that's this is part of the wrath of god on planet earth is that uh, he returns to uh, to slaughter his enemies at armageddon and to begin to set up his kingdom yes and he touches down on the place where he ascended and that actually triggers an earthquake and then he heads to the battle of armageddon and there is a passage in there jeff kinley that says something like if if he hadn't returned like this no flesh would be saved that is an ominous statement i mean do you think whether there going to be nuclear bombs going off all over the planet or what? No flesh would be saved if he had returned when he did. Well, at this, at this point in, in human history and in the tribulation period, uh, things are, are heated up to a boiling point all over the world. And uh, obviously coming against Israel, the whole world's hatred is against Israel. And I think Christ comes back to, to obviously to save Israel from complete annihilation. Uh, but also, you know, we know in Second Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord's patience is great and he's not willing that any should perish. And that he's waiting for people to come. But there does come a point, Jan, where God says, okay, let the heavens let forth the, the water and we're going to flood this earth, you know, let the clouds break forth, or my son is coming back uh, for judgment. So so God does have a point uh, set in time where his patience does run out, and would he not come back and, and do his judgment and his wrath on planet earth? And yeah, humanity very likely would destroy itself. Yes, incredible thought. Uh, Jeff, there will be people uh, coming to faith during that tribulation time. So there'll be a, a body of believers. Uh, they're going to go through incredibly difficult times, but they will be caught up in this, this scenario as well. 
well. Yeah, it's kind of the rain falls and the just and the absolutely the principle here. And you know, the, the Bible tells us that in Revelation 13 that that there will be a mark uh, of the beast. We call it the 666, where you cannot buy or sell unless you take the mark. And Scripture tells us that no believer will take that mark. And so the penalty for that is beheading. And very interesting in, in Revelation 20, where it talks about beheading, that word that is used is a word that just means a barbaric sawing of the neck and the mm-hmm. head area. You know, it, it, we've come all the way back to the Stone Age almost, Janet, in, in the Revelation, where some of our methods and some of the, the depravity of humanity really is just on parade uh, during this time. So, yes, believers will suffer just maliciously under this uh, type of Antichrist rule. They'll pay with their lives. Do you feel uh, he could be alive now? Yes, I do. I actually do feel he could be alive now. Obviously, I think Satan does not know, you he know, when not. God's timetable. He's not privy to that. So uh, I think that Satan has sort of floated out candidates from time to time throughout human history when he felt like the time was right. And uh, certainly right now is a, is a time that's very ripe for these events to take place. So is he? I don't know. Could he be? Absolutely. Throughout history, names have been thrown out. And in the last 30, 40 years, names have been thrown out. I'm not going to go through those names. And some are intriguing, to say the least. And I think the the one of perhaps the most intriguing here in the last few years is Emmanuel Macron, president of France. But, you know, as we speak, his approval rating in France has gone down. It's tanked to, I think, less than 20 percent. He's impressive as he's trying to maneuver leadership in the European Union, but it is home nation, France, is ready to throw the bomb out. Well, absolutely. In the in a post-rapture scenario, th- there'll be a huge leadership vacuum, and someone with great charisma, with great uh, diplomatic skills, uh, with a sense of a connection with other leaders is going to step into that vacuum and bring a sense of relative peace and relative safety and relative calm to an otherwise chaotic and confusing situation. And it could be someone as charming as someone like the president of France. You know, it's quite interesting that some of the candidates that people have said, well, he could be the Antichrist or this person over here, they all possess certain qualities that you say, well, I can see how that would happen, but this person will have all these qualities Mm. in spades. He'll have the complete embodiment of a world leader, you know, because Satan has always wanted to rule the world, and this will be his final attempt to do that. Well, I enjoy kind of uh, speculating on some of this. We also have to be very careful and not be reckless about it, as some are, and of course, you can visit YouTube anytime and find about 100 and 200 and 300 videos on who the Antichrist might be, and I caution folks to be very careful when you do that. When I come back, Jeff, we, we've got a short session left. And what I'm doing, folks, is I, and I'm taking it from the book that we carry on covering the secrets of Bible prophecy by my guest, Jeff Kinley. And you can learn more at jeffkinley.com. Uh, you can get the book from Olive Tree, olivetreeviews.org, views as in viewpoint, olivetreeviews.org. You can give my office a call. You can sign up for print and e-newsletters. It'll be offered in those as well. When I get back, we're going to wrap up our conversation. I'm going through his list of what lies ahead. It's in this book. There's so much more in the book that we can't get to because of time, but we're at least giving a little tease as to, I think you need to know the path that lies ahead, the roadmap ahead for the believer, for that matter, for the unbeliever. Okay, we're back in a couple of minutes. In today's world, we just don't hear enough about what God's Word says about the end times. It seems people don't want to know, perhaps because they don't want to believe we are nearing the end. The Bible is clear. As the end approaches, our world will resemble the days of Noah, when people were totally unaware of what was about to happen. We want to keep people informed of what the Bible says will happen. So we air programs like you're hearing today. If this kind of programming is important to you, will you help us to proclaim our message? With the cost of media going up, we need more weekly listeners to help us maintain this vital outreach on 830 radio stations across America. You can partner with us through our website, olive3views.org, or when you write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Or call us at 763-559-4444. We will rejoin our conversation with author Jeff Kinley in just a moment. As our year winds down, we want to thank all of you who have supported this radio outreach in 2018. 
We now air on over 825 radio stations and around the world electronically. You have made this possible. There is still time for a year-end gift. You can do so online at our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. You can also call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. Or just drop us a note with a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We call this program Radio for the Remnant. If you are a remnant believer, we hope you will encourage one another and look up for our redemption draws nigh. If our headlines have you down, remember, everything is falling into place. My passion uh, has always been to help people know Jesus better and to fall more in love with Him. That's really the end game, because when you love God, you obey His commandments. George Barna just recently released a statistic that's very alarming. He said that 18% of those who attend church read their Bibles on a regular basis, on a daily basis. That statistic is alarming to me, but it tells me something about where the church is. It tells me why the church so easily receives all these false doctrines, these deluding belief systems that are going on in our culture today, because they've never been equipped. Just one more reminder, today's radio guest, Jeff Kinley, returns next week to continue this two-part series. Now for the conclusion of today's conversation, again, Jan Markell. And so my question is, though, as a shepherd myself, is how in the world can you be a faithful shepherd if you skip nearly one-third of the Bible that deals directly or indirectly with Bible prophecy? Are you saying that it's not a blessing to the sheep when God says so blatantly to the contrary that it is? Are you smarter than Him? Do you know more than God? Why would you, a shepherd who professes to love the sheep, want to keep the sheep from a blessing? Is that being a loving shepherd? Is that showing genuine concern for them? Besides, as a shepherd, we're supposed to teach the flock the whole counsel of God, not just some of it. And and, and who makes you the arbitrator? And, And what gives you the right to decide which portions of the Bible are good versus bad for God's people when God says it's all good. It's all from Him, especially Bible prophecy. The facts are Bible prophecy is some of the best news we could ever hear as Christians and it is the much needed antidote to deal with the perilous days we live in where evil abounds. The book of Revelation is not doom and gloom. Rather, it reminds me that I'm going to heaven, a a place beyond my wildest dreams. I'm going to the millennium where my greatest adventure awaits. And best of all, I'm going to see my King Jesus face to face, who loves me and who won for me an amazing life for all eternity. What a, what a blessing that news is. And it's all obtained when you read and hear and take to heart the prophetic events that are 100% accurately recorded for us only in the Bible. The more I study them, the more I, I'm reminded that Jesus Christ, uh, that in Him as a Christian, I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. I'm blessed beyond measure. What a future that is in store for me. It's awesome. In fact, nobody has a brighter, more secure future than God's people. And welcome back. Again, that was Pastor Billy Crone, and he's got amazing products himself. You can find them at getalifemedia.com. I believe it is getalifemedia.com. He was one of my speakers, Understanding the Times 2018, and we're offering those CDs and DVDs. We uh, stress the DVDs because the amount of video used by my speakers including Pastor Billy Crone, Amir Sarfati, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Pastor J.D. Farag, and Eric Barger. Check them out on my website, olivetreeviews.org. Give my office a call. We've got wonderful products from that conference, and we're beginning to prepare 2019, which will be Saturday, September 21st. I don't want to take time to go into that. Remember, all programming posted to my website every Saturday, olivetreeviews.org, or get the oneplace.com mobile app, oneplace.com mobile app. 
app, have it downloaded to your devices. I'm heading into the close of this hour. Because of the content that's left ahead, Jeff Kinley has graciously agreed to come back next weekend so we can wrap up a lot of things. The, more of the things to come, because I don't want to spare some details to these things to come. Also want to talk some current events with Jeff as well. But Jeff, let's quickly head back into an outline of what lies ahead. Let's quickly go to Israel's judgment, because the Jews surviving the tribulation would be the first to pass under God's judgment and allowed into the kingdom. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, these, these are the Jews. Uh, I believe those are the wise virgins of, of Matthew chapter 25. You know, there's going to be, uh, you know, as Paul said in, in Romans 11, thus all Israel will be saved. These are the ones that God has preserved. And so they need to, uh, to pass under that judgment to enter into the joy of their Lord into the millennial kingdom. So I think that's going to take place between the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. As, as Daniel indicates, there'll be a period of about 75 days there for some of these events to take place. And I think perhaps maybe even opportunity opportunity to just prepare a, you know, a ravaged earth landscape in preparation for a new kingdom there. So I think that's going to be probably the timing of this uh, judgment for Israel. Then let's move to the judgment of the Gentiles. Now that is uh, Matthew 25, 31 through 46. We read there about the, the sheep and the goats, the goats, uh, the Gentiles who survived the tribulation, the sheep, the Gentiles who will inherit the kingdom. They will join the rest of the redeemed and begin the celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb in the millennium. Talk to me a little bit about that then. I've got a question to you about the least of these, and uh, but let's first talk about what I just referenced here. Sheep and goats, marriage supper of the Lamb, let's head there. Yeah, I mean, think about being a believer during the tribulation and actually surviving that global event there, and what an incredible sense of relief to know that your, your Lord has returned. He's slain his enemies, and he's about to invite you into this uh, this celebration, this wedding celebration with the bride in the millennium. So it'll be a great time of joy for those sheep. On the other hand, though, Jan, for the for the goats, for those who don't know Christ, for those unbelievers that happen to survive this horrible time in earth's history they're going to be cast into hell yes they are then talk to me just a minute here because matthew 25 40 refers to the least of these now we've we've heard all sorts of thoughts and interpretations of that verse that it's okay it's immigrants it's who knows it's poor people i feel it's jews give me your take on this verse yeah, I mean, it's it's people that, that are obviously living during the, the tribulation period, and uh, those are the ones that, that respond positively to the message of Christ. Uh, obviously, Matthew 25, Matthew 24 is dealing primarily with a, a Jewish audience mm-hmm. in the end times. So, uh, and I can totally see how that Jewish audience will be the ones that Christ will be responding to, because, you know, when you minister to those who, who know Christ, you're ministering to Christ himself, and those are the least of these. And so Jesus will welcome those uh, into the kingdom that, that have responded responded positively to his uh, message of salvation through the Jewish people. I'm just going uh, backwards here for a brief moment to get your perspective on something. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Right now, judgment of the nations, we're in Matthew 25. I'm going backwards to Matthew 24. Do you feel, uh, Jeff Kinley, there's any reference in Matthew 24 to the rapture? Again, you have said Matthew 24, and we all know it, that's really a passage given to Israel. Could there be any reference to the rapture there? You know, I, I really don't see a, a specific reference to the rapture in that passage just because of the context in which Jesus is speaking there. A lot of people have taken verses 40 and 41 about one being taken and one being left and really think that refers more to be t- being taken uh, into judgment there. Yes, I, I would uh, agree. So I really see this more of an of a explicitly Jewish context referring to the tribulation period and referring to, uh, to judgment and uh, to what's going to happen on the earth. And, and of course, you know, we, when we interpret the Bible, we, we see the whole Bible, not just one passage. So I think people have tried to sort of shoehorn the rapture into places where it doesn't exist and missed it in places where it does exist. Yes. Uh-huh. So there's obviously many more scriptures that tell us about the rapture and, and how it would relate to this time in Matthew 24. Okay, well, you know, that is a huge controversy because a lot of people feel there's at least a couple of verses in there. You re- alluded to a couple of them, and, and I get emails to that effect all the time, but try to be careful there as well. All right, in the time we have left, let's spend a few minutes on it, uh, Jeff, on uh, on Satan's binding, because this is huge. That comes next. That's Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, he's going to get thrown, thankfully, into the bottomless pit. We're going to get rid of him 
for about a thousand years. The door is going to shut and seal him for that amount of time in solitary confinement. Frankly, I hope I'm sitting on the sidelines. I can cheer over this. Yeah, absolutely. I think we will be, Jan. You know, it's interesting. You know, the Bible tells us that Satan is our adversary. He's our greatest enemy. We're nowhere told to fear him, and we're certainly not told to try to bind him in some way. In fact, the only time that Satan is is truly bound is when he's bound during this uh, millennial kingdom, and the Bible says that an angel uh, does that. And so there's an angel who has great authority who is uh, able to do that. You know, as believers now, we resist the devil, we flee from the devil, we stand firm against him, but it's the angel that binds him. And that's going to be a time where his influence, at least, is not going to be felt during the Millennial Kingdom. So we'll be rid of him for for a thousand years, and uh, that's got to make a difference in our lives. He is going to be let out. We should probably hang on to that thought. I do want to pick up on it next week. We're going to continue this discussion next weekend, folks. But, I mean, it puzzles me why God lets him out again, and we don't know the mind of God. So let's talk about that next week, though, that his release and the final rebellion rebellion. That is Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10, because some throughout the millennium are going to have been duped by him. So yeah. he's let out again. There's going to be another Gog-Magog war. Is that anything to do with Ezekiel 38, 39? Nope, not a thing. We'll explain it next week. But the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the devil are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone eventually for forever and ever. Then there's coming, folks, a white throne judgment. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, God's going to destroy heaven and earth after After the millennium? Why would he want to do that? I think we need to talk about it. And then comes a glorious new heavens and new earth, uh, something fresh like never before, all things made new. We'll talk about that as well next week because I tell you that 